Hi team, it's Michaela again. Um, what we're going to do in this next 20 minutes is we're going to do a mechanical problem troubleshooting um, little whiz bang scenario. So we're not going to go through um, patients and which patient would you do when and pathology. Um, as my old boss used to say, mechanical problems require mechanical solutions. So we're going to go through those. So I'm now going to um, show you the CRRT machine and not spit on it because it's not slid. And uh, we're just going to quickly go through um, just various things in your head that you look at when the alarm goes ping and the nurse goes and you're like, oh, just sit down. So, uh, do you have in your head, um, do you have a little pro forma as to what you do, what you do next, how you're going to work things out? Let's talk about access pressures. Let's do the first one. Access alarm. Call the and say no. Okay, Check fair the enough. The pressure, I mean, obviously you want to check which alarm it is. And mm. then, I guess, with access pressures, just quickly check there's nothing being kicked or yeah, uh, yeah, or, yeah. Or clamps yeah. or yeah. 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 So, so the, the mantra, and especially if you're, you're planning on writing this very fast in the middle of a fellowship exam, um, the mantra is: is it the patient? Is it the machine? Is it the access catheter? So if you if you sort through patient, vascat, machine for pretty much every problem, then you'll sort it all, and you can certainly exclude stuff you know pretty quickly and straight away. It also makes a nice little table that helps you write quick when you've got to go down the fellowship route for this. In terms of the access, if you put it in yourself, it's never that. Um, <laughs> it's never going to be the catheter. However, if the catheter is short, it may well be. If the catheter is short and the patient's big and they're struggling, um, it may well be. So in terms of access alarm, your catheter may be fine, but if your patient is kinking it and moving, um, and otherwise rat bag around the bed, then you're gonna have to fix the patient because it doesn't matter what you do, it will fail if it kinks all the time. So have a look at the patient. Maybe they need sedation. Maybe they need deep sedation. Occasionally, if you've got a really dodgy access, maybe they need paralysis, um, intubate them first. Um, in CRRT, they'll be intubated. In terms of the, of the vascular access, do you have any sort of quick bedside test that you do with your catheters to see whether it's a sort of internal kink in your catheter? Swap the lumens over. Yep, totally. And swap the lumens over. So suck is blow and blow is suck. Um, that may, um, that may, especially if it's up against um, the side of the wall. The other thing that you could do is you can get a 20 mil mm -hmm. syringe and, um, yeah, nodding now, the syringe test, um, and just put it on a tip and suck back quickly. If you can suck back really quickly and there's no impediment, put the blood back, um, then uh, you've got a working catheter. If you don't, then it doesn't matter what you do, um, you can flip it if you like and have a go, but it's, it's done. There is something in there that has ruined your catheter um, and there's no point going down the sedation or this, because you will fail, which is a shame. Time for a new catheter. The last thing is the machine. So if you've got an access problem and you just have absolutely nowhere else to go with your catheter or your space, the space, is it a burns patient? Are they really fat? Was it just an enormously difficult struggle to find anything? Is your um, ultrasound uh, more like ultrasonic sort of harpooning rather than something that's four centimetres next to the surface? Um, then the only other option you've got um, is a fast blood flow. And uh, your patient may not be able to tolerate that from a cardiovascular point of view. Maybe you can suck it harder or maybe you can slow it down and inch the blood fast and just play around with your blood flow rates. If you slow the blood flow rate down, your dialysis is going to be worse, so maybe you'll have to turn your dialysate rate up to see if you can get the same sort of efficiency. But uh, then, then we're starting to talk about really sort of, um, you know, is it really worth it? That's the trouble. Right, so these, these are your access alarms um, and access problems. The next problem, I'll spot places with your guess. Hello, you're getting again. Um, so we'll talk about, um, I think we initially started with access problems, then the idea is to then to look at flow problems, uh, either on the machine, which is the tubing and the circuit, and also look at the pressure problems, which lie within the filter, as well as access and return pressures. Uh, the flow problems, because it's a machine specific issue, I think I'll let Michael, who's just about to walk in, uh, deal with it, but I'll talk about the pressure problems, which essentially, relate to access pressures, so arterial limb and return pressures or to venous limb. Uh, so arterial and venous limb pressures are related to the vascat, so which means you've just dealt with the vascat problems. 
so we'll then move on to the kidney or artificial kidney there and look at uh, two different types of problems that commonly occur in the kidney. One is the uh, rise in transmembrane uh, pressures, which means the diffusion is a problem. So you have either layering of proteins, layering of paraproteins, layering of drugs, uh, middle molecules of inflammation, infection, uh, interleukins, bradykinins, which layer the por por uh, porosity of, of the uh, semi-permeable membrane, making it less porous to diffusion and convection therefore blocking the pores, therefore making high pressures for the pumps to drive uh, the fluid out, therefore causing an ineffective dialysis. So the transmembrane pressure uh, going up, essentially you could do a couple of things. One is just run a liter of saline through the filter to dilute the blood going in through the filter and then try and wash the filter if you like, and then reconnect the patient and see what the pressures are. If the patient's pr uh, pressures drop, then you know that you've cleared the potential problem. If the pressure pressures don't drop, then you've got to change the filter, no, no, no other options. Uh, the other pressures are because of clot, and so the transmembrane pressure rise is separate to the clotting. Clotting can occur pretty much anywhere in the circuit. Uh, if you have a post-filter uh, dilution going in, a replacement fluid going in, then you're very likely to cause clotting, which is very close to the venous exit point of the filter, because the blood is, has the maximum viscosity by then, because Blood's coming in here with its normal viscosity, then gets cleared, dialyzed, and then fluid gets ripped off from the blood. And then this is a very thick, viscous blood that sits there. And then as the flow is being less in CRRT, very high risk of clotting. So you often find nursing staff going there and looking at the clots, purple, blue colored stuff there. That's a clot. If that is clotted, you know, there's no point in recirculating, reflushing, nothing, just change the, uh, change the filter. You might want to then look at your anticoagulation dosage and how you actually anticoagulate in the patient. Look at your APTTs, look at your 10A levels and stuff like that. Okay. So that's the pressure side of things. And the return, uh, if I can, is again got to do with the VASCAT. So position of the VASCAT, kinking in the circuit, is all related to the pressure rises in the return uh, limb of the circuit. 